that they are strict about time. And uh, okay, okay. I thought it was fine. You start, everyone, and uh, thank. Yeah, right. Thank you for coming, everyone. In the nineteen, you know, nineteen hundreds, and uh, global life expectancy was only thirty-one years old. Now it exceeds seventy-two years. On the longest life expect expectancy rates are about eighty-one for women, eighty-one for men in some country like Hong Kong, Iceland, and Japan. The fact that the people are living longer can be taken as an aging society. At the same time, we've been observing low birth rates. In some countries, their birth rates, which is the average number of babies or women, give birth to from 8 up to 49 years old. The result of the two phenomena has been causing population decrease or the demographic change. As you can guess, and very easily, this demographic changes have the government's pension provisions and the social care costs are under pressure. It can be more severe under the time of the new coronavirus epidemic. How can science and business collaborate with government to tackle many issues concerning their Asian societies? And what are the secrets of longevity? And how can everybody live a long life? What are the implications for individual life and business? Welcome to Horses' Extraordinary Meeting. The session title is We Are Living Longer. My name is Kenji Okoyama and the President of the Association of Asia Pacific Business Schools and the Vice President of Mitsumeikan Asia Pacific Business School. I'm having five prominent guest speakers who are most relevant people for this topic, I'm sure. Now I'll ask each speaker to say something following their self-introduction. Okay, according to the name list, no alphabetical order. And uh, Mr. Greg Christian. And uh, can I ask you to uh, to and uh, self-introduction? And after that, please. Uh, sure, how do you do, sir? Most of my background is, has been in insurance. Uh, so for today, I'm going to focus on those aspects. Uh, as, as you said, Kenji, uh, there's been a marked increase in terms of life expectancy. And because of that marked increase in life expectancy, um, we have got a, an increase in risk. And the risk is longevity risk. So the insurance industry, of course, thrives on risk. And and that's that's basically what they insure. So uh, what uh, the industry has been looking at has been how to deal with longevity risk. Um, and there's there's uh, there's certainly a, a lot of uh, need to do so uh, because actually the way that uh, that uh, the society has been structured, particularly in the, the more developed countries has been uh, for people when they retire or coming up to retirement to have a, a plan. Uh, so if they're in the workforce, they would normally be given one of two types of plans. They're normally given either a, a defined benefit plan or a defined contribution plan. Now, with a defined benefit plan, that means that at the end of your working life, you would be given a set lump sum. Uh, it may be it may be commuted into an annuity, and I can explain those terms if anyone wants me to, uh, but usually a lump sum. And the alternative is the defined contribution plan, which is becoming more and more popular. Uh, the defined contribution plan is where you have a certain contribution. You know how much you've got to contribute, but you don't actually know how much you're going to get upon retirement. So uh, the that very much depends on the way in which the investment has been managed during all of your working years. 
But uh, I, I just like to, if I have uh, an opportunity, just give you some figures to give you an idea of what the risk is in mm. various countries. Uh, so there are just just taking four of the more developed countries. Um, so the these figures come from the North American Actuarial Journal, uh, and uh, this is just mm. last year. So they're, they're pretty up to date. So the, these are the liabilities that these countries have for defined contribution, um, I'm sorry, defined benefit plans. So for Canada, they have a liability of 1.5 trillion US dollars. For the US, it's 3.2 trillion. For the UK, it's 1.9 trillion. For the Netherlands, it's 1.5 trillion. So those four countries alone have a liability of 8.1 trillion dollars. Now, in Mexico some years ago, the, uh, the, the court there already ordered the Mexican government to top up $2.5 billion uh, to their uh, defined um, benefit plan. So the insurance industry has been stepping in to try to mitigate some of this. Um, and, and again, I'll try and give you some figures. And you can see that we are a long, long way from mitigating this risk. Um, so, for instance, in Canada, the industry has mitigated by 75 billion against the 1.5 trillion. In the US, it's pretty terrible. They've done 1.9 mm -hmm. billion against 3.2 trillion. Uh, in the UK, they've got the 1.9 trillion and they have mitigated at uh, 23 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, the Netherlands, as far as we know, have not mitigated it at all. So there's a hell of a lot that needs to be done to bring things around. Uh, of course, the the elephant in the room uh, is China and, and India, uh, but I, I don't actually know what's, what's really happening in India. But in China, um, by 2050, uh, there's going to be uh, mostly baby boomers. There's going to be another 245 million uh, people will mm. have retired and they're going to need to have some sort of plan. So mm. um, if we have, I'll talk some more about the way in which the industry is trying to mitigate and some of the things that regulators can do, because obviously what we're talking about here is how we can work together with government and industry. Thank you. And uh, uh, Greg, okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Greg, can you hear me? Oh, yes, no? I can hear you. Sir. Okay, that's the end of your speech, yes, right? Yes, yes, for the moment. Okay. Thank you very much. It's just a very scary number, isn't it? Also, the situation is uh, quite similar in Japan, too, actually. Thank you for thank you for your very, very, you know, uh, eye-opening, you know, and uh, facts and figures. Okay, I'm going to introduce and the next speaker, and uh, Peya. Emilson from Sweden. Okay, Piet. Mr. Piet, Mr. Emilson. Okay, can you hear me now? I oh, said so you, you meet, muted yourself. Yeah, okay, sure. now you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you for participation. Thank you. Let me start with the first question that you put to explain the situation of age society in my country and its implications to my business. You know, Sweden is famous yes, for being please. a welfare state from cradle to grave. Uh, very egalitarian principle in a country mm. which is very, very individualistic. You know, in Sweden, it's based on the individual, individ, not family. Tradition has been that uh, mm. health care, elderly care has been provided for by mm. very, very few exceptions with private alternative. We have had the idea one size fits all. There was a change initiated about 25 years ago where we opened up for alternatives in education, health care and elderly care alternative producers, but still financed through taxes. 
And in the situation now with the demographic change and the increased demand in quality care, this has opened up for lots of changes. And that's where I launched about 10 years ago a concept that I call Silver Life from go go to slow go to no go. You know, it's a phase we all will go through. Very few people are lucky to suddenly die. Most of us will face a few years quite tough situations. So we then developed a, a concept by which you move into a place when you still can control it, and then you will get care a few times a day. And then step by step, you know, when the time is ripe, you can move into the final station where you get the most more than possible care as possible. I've been to Japan many times and studied what you're doing in robotics and others. So we we have now built a place which is, I would perceive as probably the best in elderly care that is in Sweden. The next issue is then who will pay for this? Because basically you have a everything covered by taxes, but of course, with a situation where 60% of what the households own are controlled by those that are 70 plus, people are prepared to spend more on their own money. So you are trying to find a combination between what you get through taxes and what you can pay for by yourself. You know, in Sweden, we have no heritage tax. We have no wealth tax. Uh, you get into some very interesting moral issues. Who should pay for my elderly care? Should I ask all taxpayers to pay for it so I can give money free to my children? Uh, or in this dramatic demographic change, would you require each generation to pay more for themselves? Assume more responsibility? And how do you accept the fact that there are lots of individual solutions and wishes when you get old. So we have a very, very interesting discussion in Sweden at present. How do we form the next step in how people will live during the 10, 20 last years of their lives? Uh, in Sweden, it's been so regulated. You are basically not allowed to have health care in elderly care. It's another. So now, after the corona situation, you know, we had a tremendous amount of dead in the elderly care situations in Sweden. You know, we are on the top there, and then we have managed the pandemic fairly better in other respects. But that has created a new debate. What kind of resource will we put? How will we organize it? How will you see combination with private-public partnerships? So I see enormous opportunities uh, for changes here. I see lots of private enterprise opportunities. I see an uh, increased demand for people to be able to spend their money on care instead of buying stuff. And uh, I'm amazed to see how the change in behavior will, what will happen now in the, after the pandemic and uh, how people's attitudes will change. It's, uh, dramatic uh, opportunities and challenges that, of course, also will take this step in the worldwide change. Thank you. K Kenji, you're muted. Could you unmute your microphone, please? Mr. Kenji, could you uh, unmute your microphone, maybe? We cannot hear you.
Kenji, you're going to have to unmute your microphone. Okay. We, who would be next? We've we lost him. Just, we can Sorry. just check who would be next in line. Oscar. If it was an alphabetic <laughs> order. Oh, now. Something. Yes, now we can hear you. My turn? Okay, so I'm going to go next. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tanya and I'm based in Switzerland, uh, similar to uh, what uh, Peje just said. Uh, similar. Okay, Tanya? Yes, thank you. Uh, welfare state as well. And um, I would like to first read uh, the Article 22 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says, everyone as a member of society has the right to social security and is entitled to realization through national effort and international co Yes, can you hear can me? You? Yes, you have yes, I have started. Yes, I'm sorry, I okay. can't hear you right now. Okay, okay. So I will restart then quickly, yes. huh? Because I just started. So I was saying that I will start by reading. Uh... Thank you. No, you can take your time, you can take your time. Okay. So I will start by reading Article 22 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says that everyone as a member of society has the right to social security and is entitled to realization through national effort and international cooperation and in accordance mm. with the organization and the resources of each mm. state of the economic social and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. And this article is the basis for my reflection. Mm. Um, in ancient times, alchemists were looking for to find the philosopher's stone, which was also known as the elixir of life, useful for rejuvenation and immortality. Not only alchemists, but since the dawn of civilization, some of the th central themes preoccupying humankind to this day are and will remain the questions about the afterlife, how to live longer, as well as if the soul is immortal or not. And there is no shortcut in achieving mm. immortality. We just increased life expectancy, mainly through the advancement of hygiene, education and medicine. And most of it was achieved by trial and error and pioneers who relentlessly try to improve the conditions and the well-being of humankind. And I admit I do not have the capacity mm. to stand on the shoulders of giants. I lack the philosophical and historical background. However, since I was asked to join this panel, I asked myself, what the common understanding of longevity is. Is it a pure metric equal to the mm. years that we live? Or does longevity mean living longer while the basic human needs, including dignity, social security, and free development of personality prevail? So the things that I mentioned or mentioned in Article 22 of the Human Rights Declaration. So then I thought about a few ideas of what we could do and I just want to throw them in. It's very simplified, but I thought that uh, states and governments should encourage uh, people even after the age of retirement to actually stay in the workforce if they want. Um, it doesn't need to be 100 percent, but they could work for one or two days a week. And companies, therefore, also need to be incentivized to actually keep uh, older people in the workforce as nowadays 65 is not like being 65 year olds. Uh, old 40 years ago and uh, like this uh, we will have still mm. a social life a purpose are included and elderly people can also share their knowledge with younger ones and by offering these activities and events where seniors can commingle learn new skills or even mentor younger generations seniors can stay physically and mentally active which will hopefully lead to a healthier life and relieve mm. the social care system. And I think what is very important is also to create an intergenerational debate because we talk a lot about diversity, mostly about gender or racial diversity, mm. but I think age diversity is something that is very important too. And I think a society where generations uh, mm. live apart is a, is a dysfunctional one. 
So it's all about inclusion and participation. Um, and there, uh, there is another idea uh, that I also had is that we can take uh, science, corporations and governments to take the 17 uh, sustainable development goals as a framework for all their activities, meaning they invest in the goals uh, that are also targeted in improving the life of older generations. And at the same time, we should always keep Article 22 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in mind, which says we should keep the dignity for everyone and the freedom of development of personality within the capacity of the state, of course, and through international cooperation. And I would like to add until the very last breath. And the paradox thing for me is that we all will get old. We will all one day be at that stage and we're not really doing something. Um, and it would actually be an investment into our own future. So we need to do something to age in dignity because only then longevity is something that we should strive for. Thank you. Thank you, Tania. And uh, age diversity is a good notion, isn't it? Yeah, positive one. Thank you. Just in case, I'm you know disconnect connected once again. I like Greg to uh, take this uh, you know chairpersonship. Just in case, can I ask Greg? Okay. Okay. Sure. sure. Okay. Anyway, shall we move on to the next speaker? And uh, yes, uh, Gary Phillips, Mr. Gary Phillips from the United States. Well, thank you for that. And um, I'm going to pick up on a few of the uh, the themes that Tanya just uh, uh, um, listed in her speech. Uh, so just to introduce myself, I'm Gary Phillips. Uh, I've spent a lot of my life uh, focused on how to extend and improve uh, life. Um, I, I trained first as a molecular biologist uh, and, and as a physician and also have training in health policy uh, and economics. Um, practiced medicine for a number of years as a primary care physician. Uh, afterwards, uh, entered pharmaceutical and medical device industry, where I've spent most of my career, and at, for a period of time was at the World Economic Forum, uh, and where I managed the health section of the forum and, and the Davos meeting. So I have some experience in, all around healthcare and medicine and, and medical devices. So in some ways, my industry uh, is actually the um, – uh, you know, somewhat responsible for it. if we pose aging as a problem. Uh, I think that um, pharmaceuticals and biotechnology has contributed to that problem, though I, I would like to refra reframe aging not as a problem, not as, as something as a cost, but rather as an investment. If, if you think back, you know, at uh, the beginning of the 20th century, the average life expectancy was around late 30s, about 40 years old. And today it's over 80, as Kenji uh, said at the beginning. Now, it's interesting when I look back at history and you think about, you know, wow, Napoleon did this by this age, or you say Henry VIII did this by this age, or you think that Beethoven did this by this age. Well, they were going to die by 40. So the framework of a life was you better get it done by 40 or you're going to be gone. Now we, we turn around and in my country, the United States, the two candidates who are running for president are in their mid to late 70s. So a completely different reframe. I'd love to know in a couple decades if I'll still have the energy to run a country. Uh, I'll probably never get the chance. But uh, to think about um, what medicine and, and pharmaceuticals uh, has done through vaccines, through anti-infectives, through treatments for chronic disease like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer treatment, we've been able to extend life. And I'd say in many instances, we've been able to improve the quality of that life as well. Um, so the question now becomes, not only how can we continue to extend life, but also how can we improve the life that uh, exists, especially in the later years, as the later years, the boundaries of the years continue to extend. And so we think about going from uh, a, a time where we talk about lifespan to a period where we're talking about health span. So how do we keep people active, healthy, contributing, and happy, mm. especially in the later years of life? So first, you know, there's a, there's a lot of money going into uh, finding ways to extend life. In fact, uh, recently, um, a couple of Silicon Valley uh, billionaires have actually created funds. Mm -hmm. One was a uh, $100 million longevity vision fund by one Silicon Valley billionaire, and another one's called the Juvenescence Fund, another $100 million. And as a result, there are a lot of 
com- biotechnology companies who are trying to get underneath mm-hmm. what is it that is in the essentially the human code that leads to your ones dying somewhere you know in the early 100s and can we push that and so there's a lot of research coming out around how does protein degrade mm-hmm. how do dna changes occur and and how can we think about patching that or re-engineering that through the new new tools like crispr gene therapy and things like that to extend life. And so there is a certain amount of effort and money going into how do we push the boundaries of life into the mid 100 range rather from today in the early 100 range. Um, in fact, p- children born today can reasonably expect to live to 100 uh, years old. And so how do we continue to push that? But equally important, if not more important, is how do you make those, those lit- latter years more functional? So how do we improve uh, um, uh, physical function through uh, artificial organs? Or how do we improve cognitive function through treatment of things like Alzheimer's disease? So how do we make people happy and functional? So we think about, wow, they needed to get it all done by age 80 because they were going to die. To now 80 is sort of midlife. And, And think about how do you make people more productive during that time? So then you change the narrative around how aging is a cost to society into aging is actually a, an investment for societal growth and economic prosperity. And so um, there is a lot of work being done in that space. Uh, you know, not, there hasn't been a lot of um, breakthrough, a lot of progress in the area of, say, Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, a lot of those uh, therapies have failed in development. But money continues to be put into that. Investment continues. And, and I truly believe that uh, we all probably just lived a little bit too early because uh, we're probably on the verge of breakthroughs coming from the, uh, the discovery of DNA and pro- proteins in the 1950s. We're probably just seeing the dawn of the, of the outcome of that now. And that will really be delivered over the next probably 50 years or so. So I'm quite optimistic about uh, the future uh, that science and technology will will bring uh, humanity, and uh, not only through um, uh, through improvement and in, in improvement in length of life, quality of life, but the economic return of that improvement as well. And so, th- there were my comments. Thank you very much. And uh, I think I thought it was a quite positive thing. But uh, when you live long, then there's another problem, such as pension problem. Or the, the important thing is the health, healthy life, if you live long anyway. But it is quite positive idea. Okay. Then, and uh, last but not least, uh, Miss Tina Woods. I'm going to ask you to make a presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much and so glad to be here. Uh, and actually, it's it's good to be last because I can say actually and truthfully that um, my presentation will pick up on all the points. Uh, and it, it's it's quite interesting that uh, many of oh, the, the messages and the points that have so far oh, are very, very resonant with what, what I've been doing. So uh, so I, um, I think the title of our talk was We Are Living Longer, but I would ask, ask the question, are we living better? Mm. And I think all the points that have been raised so far is all mm. to do with that because I mean, science technology certainly have advanced, you know, how long we can live and uh, absolutely. But I think the real question is, are we living better and in better health? And I would even question whether we are with the chronic disease epidemic that we have at the moment, which uh, I'll come on to in a second. But uh, health span, I've heard that um, word mentioned, and that's a lot of what I've been focused on. So I'll just give a little bit of a flavor for what I've been up to, um, which puts everything in the context, also in the UK scenario. So in the UK, the the government um, has committed significant government funding uh, via its industrial strategy, uh, including the Aging Society Grand Challenge that is there to address the challenges, but also the vast opportunities of living longer. And I think the, the, the whole way that we see living longer, the whole um, narrative around that, I think, mm-hmm. is one of the fundamental things that we really need to get right, seeing it through a much more positive lens. I've been working with UK Research and Innovation for the past three years um, with the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund team for healthy aging that is essentially there to drive the development of a socially responsible ecosystem of products and services 
for healthy and aging that will help meet the government goal that was set in 2018 and is in the, in the government manifesto commitment now to um, deliver five extra years of healthy life expectancy while minimizing the gap in, 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 in health between the richest and poorest citizens. There's a huge health inequality gap, which has been growing and indeed has been growing in other countries and uh, the US being a, a, another example of that. Um, so I think this whole question of health and wealth is absolutely fundamental. They are completely interlinked. Health inequalities and income inequalities mm -hmm. go hand in hand and actually the solutions uh, in, the, in the converse uh, scenario is also there. So in parallel, I've been leading um, as Secretariat Director, the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Longevity, which is chaired by Damien Green, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister um, of the UK, who was also involved in setting the goal of five extra years. And since last year, we, um, we've worked with over 100 experts, 50 organisations, to develop the Health of the Nation strategy on how to achieve this goal. So this was published in February, just before COVID um, started to wreak havoc in the UK scenario. So we proposed nine recommendations um, and actually through the data that has been borne out and what we've seen as a result of the pandemic, these recommendations have indeed become more urgent and more compelling. So we know the impact of COVID-19 has already been mm. felt, you know, worldwide has made it, you know, has shown up the, the fracture lines of society um, and has actually made us realize the value of our health at whatever age and the importance of keeping in good health um, for overall resilience, uh, both to this virus, but also to future pandemic risks. The Open Safely study published recently in Nature, which is a UK study, show that people, and this is my reference to chronic disease epidemic we have, mm. show that people with obesity, diabetes, coronary heart disease, and hypertension were much more likely to die from COVID-19 and also suffer from it. And these are all mostly preventable diseases linked mm. to social inequalities and with, with age as a shared risk factor. So the virus has actually made the economic case for investment in healthy aging extremely compelling. We need to collect better data on healthy aging and we need to harness um, technology in the quest to rebuild health and economic resilience in this uh, post-COVID scenario. Now, Gary spoke to um, the science of, uh, and the technology that we have as our tools. So um, this is actually the subject mm. of a book that I've just written that's being published next week. I won't share my screen because the technology never works when you want it to. Um, but it's called um, Live Longer with AI, How Artificial Intelligence is Helping Us ex Extend Our Health Span and Live Better Too. And it pulls together my journey over the past two or three years, working with government, business, and the science community to really, how do we deliver on this mission of five extra healthy years? And I have interviewed many of the, 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 the scientists and actually indeed the investors, but I think Gary, you mentioned Sergey Young, for example, and others, you know, so I've interviewed about 30 experts, you know, all deeply involved in the in the longevity space, artificial intelligence, um, the field of aging biomarkers, digital fingerprinting, I think are going to unravel the, the cure, uh, well, certainly the, the understanding of what um, is putting us at risk of these chronic diseases, but also dementia, potentially to help us find a cure for dementia very sooner than we might think. So that the pace of change in science technology is absolutely colossal. Um, so, uh, and I'll just make reference to a blog. It is actually the International day for older persons today um so a uh, blog has just come out uh, which i authored mm. uh mm. called economic forum today um so these are all the themes that we speak to and actually um the blog is focused very much on this concept of health as our most precious asset and health prevention is absolutely and fundamentally mm. what we have to focus on ahead it is at the core so um so just returning to the national strategy um so as uh, clearly with the UK scenario, and we're having a very hard time with this pandemic, as you probably all know. So while government is in, and, and our health system has been focused on COVID, mm -hmm. with the health of the nation strategy, we've been focusing on one particular recommendation, which is the business coalition for a healthier nation. Working out the details at the moment, and uh, we will be launching uh, and, and uh, providing all the detail behind it, but essentially the focus will be on improving health to support the economy and vice versa, leveling up opportunities for investment and growth across communities, particularly in long, long term, and I'm talking long term sustainable investment, preventative health and care. We talked about um, care. I want to the whole um, care homes. I would love to see the whole concept of care homes completely reimagined. Um, no one wants to live in the care homes that we are unfortunately faced with today. Um, so Business for Health has the support of many quarters, mm -hmm. including 
um, our, our Secretary of State, but also leading uh, businessmen like Paul Pullman, former CEO of Unilever. And we're proposing many things, and I don't want to talk to, for too long, but I, um, essentially on our list of, of actions is this idea of developing a risk management framework for health and corresponding index to measure business contribution to health, which of course could be used in, by any organization. And it, it, and it makes that explicit link between human health and planetary health too. And people like, who again, I've interviewed in my book, but uh, people like Professor Baron um, Peter Piot, who of course is a leading world virologist, himself suffered from COVID, is on the EU Commission for COVID, said, COVID-19 illustrates how important it is to prevent the de development of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease through healthy lifestyles. We live in a completely obesogenic environment. In order to have a better future for everybody, we need to not only work on our own health, but also respect the health of the planet. A risk management framework for health like we have in place for climate change seems essential. So I'll just finish that one point. We have to see health, preventative health and health as important as the climate change agenda. agenda. It's, we're about 10 years behind the climate change agenda. But I think the businesses that I've been speaking to, and because I know we are focused on the role of business, they think we, we should be, and picking up on our Antonia's point about the sustainability goals, we should be guiding investment and innovation decisions by ESG mm. mandates like we do for climate change, applying the same uh, criteria to healthy lifestyles and societal health. Institutional investors should be thinking about stranded asset risk that we do in climate change. We need to get the big money that's sitting in institutional firms, pension funds, capital markets to invest long term sustainable health prevention strategies to deal not only with future pandemic risk, but I would argue the huge epidemic we have in chronic diseases, unfortunately, which are perpetuated by a lot of the systems and infrastructures that we have in place. So we have to dismantle that. We're talking about systems change. So I'll finish there. Um, but I think this is absolutely fundamentally mm. at the heart of living a longer, better life is we have to live a healthier life so that our old age is better and that we can actually look forward to it rather than see it, as many of us do, with fear and, and dread and misery. Because, of course, that is often what we do see, which we have to change. And we have the power to change it now with science and technology if we work together as a collaboration focused around system change. So I'll end there. But thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, Tina. It was uh, it turned out to be a you know correct decision that uh, we ask you to you know to speak finally. I think you compiled everything quite uh, you know what shall I say, good man and professionally. Thank you very much. Then, Thank you. okay, right now, and uh, is, is there any questions uh, from your side to you know each other? If you have any questions, everyone, oh, you want to say something finally? You want to ask something? Or if you do not, let me ask you something. You know, in Japan, as I said in the beginning, and uh, we are, you know, experiencing long life longevity. That's true. But on the other hand, we are suffering from low birth rate. Right now, our, you know, uh, one woman have got 1.4 babies and in her life, actually. So it means that, and our population is decreasing gradually. Right now, every year, we are losing 500,000 people disappearing from Japan. It's a serious. We suffer from, uh, you know, uh, labor. Good chance to take advantage of, uh, you know, senior people as a workforce, I think. Is there any comments from this side? And uh, let's give a job to uh, senior people. And uh, is there any comments about this one? Oh, yeah, maybe I, I can comment, but from a different perspective. Tina, is your... yeah, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah China, please go on. China has a similar issue because China um, is now, because of their, their long, uh, more than 10-year policy of one child only, the actual figure now is only 1.2 children mm. Uh, per couple are actually being produced. So, oh, yeah. so what you've got in China is is that mm. um, not losing out, but certainly you've got the aging society. So, uh, right now there's um, 2.8 workers for every retiree, but by 2050 there are going to be 1.3 workers for every mm. retiree. They have a major mm. issue mm. coming up 
in the same way as mm. Japan, actually. Yeah. Mm. I, if I can just make a point that picks yeah, up. Yeah, I think is there any comments? Yeah, Latina, thank you. Sure, please. Sorry, is that okay? Just to just to pick up on on, on all yeah. the points that I think been made yes. very well by all the panelists. Uh, so Tanya made the point about um, engaging, you know, intergenerational and the older workforce being allowed to work. I, I think fundamentally we have to look at how we can make it easier for people to stay in work for long. And of course, a lot of it will depend on on good health, and that's of course where mm. employers will have a huge role to play. But we need more flexible working practices because, of course, a lot of a lot of purpose and enjoyment in life does come through work. So I think that's a huge element, um, and and also the lifelong learnings. Of course, it's part of you know, of putting back into society, because I think, you know, that's a huge part of what keeps people, you know, active and engaged. And these are all the things that actually keep people motivated and, and uh, to, to want to live a longer life as well. So I'll stop there. And I, I have a question for Tina. I, I think it was very interesting to hear what you yes, said that a no one wants to live in our care homes. And, you yes. know, it's if I look at the greater situation, it has been completely organized in the past by politicians and bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. And when I was into this first, I started, I wanted me to mm -hmm. take over some medley, and I mm -hmm. you can't do it that way. I had to start from scratch, build something in a different mm -hmm. way, cut all the red tape that is there. So my question is, how do you foresee in the UK the change here? And how can you get the entrepreneurial spirits, mm -hmm. competition, Mm -hmm. And doing the change because United Kingdom, I know I've been running mm -hmm. schools there, is an extremely red tape bureaucratic society. So, yeah. how can we provide that change? Yeah. So, and the Tina, Tina, just, Tina yeah. could you share what you experienced? So very, very quickly, I think this is where um, the government, UK Research and Innovation, who've provided government money and investment in the so-called Aging Society Grand Challenge, they are trying to catalyze these sorts of, of mm. large-scale transformational projects mm. in health and care. So I, I agree with you. There's a lot of a tape. Mm. I think a lot of it is fundamentally mm. about engaging with the business community and the very vibrant startup community that we do have in the UK to actually, and this is where I think institutional money also needs to enter into the space, to actually put long-term, we need, we need digitization, we need a whole fundamental mm. relook of how we actually see this whole sector so I just think it needs a fundamental rethink, some very, very large scale investment and uh, um, partly aided by government money. But I think the business community, I think, this, you know, this is where the power of what people want and engaging citizens in the decisions and speaking with their wallets as well is really going to be what drives this whole re rethink. Gary, would you like to ask something from my, you know, medical perspective? I, I don't. I don't know that I have any questions to ask uh, from a medical perspective. Um, I, I agree with what Tina no, said I, before yes. around. Okay, anyway, uh, anything. Needing, anything no, I agree with what Tina said earlier about uh, really need to focus mm -hmm. on uh, non-communicable chronic disease uh, and the obesogenic environment that exists mm -hmm. in many countries. I, I've lived in a number of countries. Uh, currently, I live in the United States. Mm -hmm lived in the UK, lived in Switzerland, uh, lived in Greece. And, and, and when I lived in the US or I lived in the UK, I see the factors which lead to this chronic disease, which I don't see, say, for example, in Switzerland. So I think you're completely right that this whole thing around communicable or non-communicable diseases and aging obviously are, are, are completely Kenya. Yes, very quickly. Did and to what something? Tina said. Yes, to what okay. Tina said. Okay. Uh, You're the uh, final speaker. Yeah. I was also thinking about an idea for pension funds, just because you know the old uh, the rates are so low currently worldwide mm. that they're investing so much money in risky assets, inflating the asset price. 
So why not starting an initiative where a small part of state-owned pension funds invest in promising companies which provide a solution to relieve the healthcare system or age tech companies and so forth. And also one more thing, uh, what Gary said about uh, the, the idea that we have of the elderly, I also think we really need to change the, the perception. Uh, I think uh, also now with COVID, we heard a lot of people saying, oh, it just hits the elderly which I find quite brutal because um, it's, you know, it's, we're, we can still, everyone can still contribute. So yeah, I just to have that in mind as well, the, the reputation of the elderly that we also can change that because there's so much we can take from, from them. I used to work with, with, a, with someone that was actually already retired and I learned so much from that person. So yeah. Thank you. I think time is up, so <laughs> I will just stop here. Thank you very much. And um, I'm sorry to say that we, we have also exhausted time. And says, let's call it a day, but let's continue talking somewhere, sometime. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. <laughs>